Hello to the next part of chapter 54 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville. And this chapter is titled The Town Ho's Story, in which Ishmael tells the story of the town ho. And I'll continue from where I stopped the last time after the mutiny has ended. And I'm really curious to find out how this will continue. But though the lakemen had induced the seamen to adopt this sort of passiveness in their conduct, he kept his own counsel, at least till all was over, concerning his own proper and private revenge upon the man who had stung him in the ventricles of his heart. He was in Radney, the chief mate's watch, and as if the infatuated man sought to run more than halfway to meet his doom, after the scene at the rigging, he insisted against the express counsel of the captain upon resuming the head of his watch at night. Upon this and one or two other circumstances, Steele killed systematically built the plan of his revenge. During the night, Radney had an unseamanlike way of sitting on the bulwarks of the quarter deck and leaning his arm upon the gunwale of the boat, which was hoisted up there a little above the ship's side. In this attitude, it was well known, he sometimes dozed. There was a considerable vacancy between the boat and the ship, and down between this was the sea. Steelkilt calculated his time and found that his next trick at the helm would come round at two o'clock in the morning of the third day from that in which he had been betrayed. At his leisure he employed the interval in braiding something very carefully in his watches below. What are you making there? said a shipmate. What do you think? What does it look like? Like a lanyard for your bag, but it's an odd one, seems to me. Yes, rather oddish, said the lakeman, holding it at arm's length before him. But I think it will answer. Shipmate, I haven't enough twine, have you any? But there was none in the forecastle. Then I must get some from old Rat. And he rose to go aft. You don't mean to go begging to him? said a sailor. Why not? Do you think he won't do me a turn when it's to help himself in the end, shipmate? And going to the mate, he looked at him quietly and asked him for some twine to mend his hammock. It was given him. Neither twine nor lanyard were seen again, but the next night an iron ball, closely netted, partly rolled from the pocket of the lakeman's monkey jacket as he was tucking the coat into his hammock for a pillow. Twenty-four hours after, his trick at the silent helm, nigh to the man who was apt to doze over the grave, always ready, dark to the seaman's hand, that fatal hour was then to come, and in the foreordaining soul of steel kilt, the mate was already stuck and stretched as a corpse with his forehead crushed in. But gentlemen, a fool saved the would-be murderer from the bloody deed he had planned, yet complete revenge he had, and without being the avenger. For, by a mysterious fatality, heaven itself seemed to step in to take out of his hands into its own the damning thing he would have done. It was just between daybreak and sunrise of the morning of the second day, when they were washing down the decks, that a stupid, Tenerife man, drawing water in the main chains, all at once shouted out, There she rose! There she rose! Jesus, what a whale! It was Moby Dick. Moby Dick, cried Don Sebastian. Saint Dominic, Sir Sailor, but do whales have christenings? Whom call you Moby Dick? A very white and famous and mostly deadly immortal monster, Don. But that would be too long a story. How, how, cried all the young Spaniards crowding. 
nay, Dons, Dons, nay, nay, I, I cannot rehearse that now. Let me get more into the airs, sirs. The chicha, the chicha, cried Don Pedro. Our vigorous friend looks faint. Fill up his empty glass. No need, gentlemen. One moment and I proceed. Now, gentlemen. So suddenly, perceiving the snowy whale within fifty yards of the ship, forgetful of the compact among the crew, in the excitement of the moment, the Tenerife man had instinctively and involuntarily lifted his voice for the monster, though for some little time past it had been plainly beheld from the three sullen mastheads. All was now a frenzy. The white whale, the white whale, was the cry from Captain Mates and Harpooners, who, undeterred by fearful rumors, were all anxious to capture so famous and precious a fish, while the dogged crew eyed askance and with curses the appalling beauty of the vast milky mass that, lit up by a horizontal spangling sun, shifted and glistened like a living old pal in the blue morning sea. Gentlemen, a strange fatality pervades the whole career of these events as if verily mapped out before the world itself was charted. The mutineer was the bowsman of the mate, and when fast to a fish it was his duty to sit next him, while Radney stood up with his lance in a prow and haul in or slacken the line at the word of command. Moreover, when the four boats were lowered, the mates got the start, and none howled more fiercely with delight than did Steelkilt as he strained at his oar. After a stiff pull, the harponeer got fast, and spear in hand, Radney sprang to the bow. He was always a furious man, it seems, in a boat. And now his bandaged cry was to beach him on the whale's topmost back. Nothing loath. His bowsman hauled him up and up through a blinding foam that blent two whitenesses together till, of a sudden, the boat struck as against a sunken ledge and, keeling over, spilled out the standing mate. That instant, as he fell on the whale's slippery back, the boat righted and was dashed aside by the swell while Radney was tossed over into the sea on the other flank of the whale. He struck out through the spray and, for an instant, was dimly seen through that veil, wildly seeking to remove himself from the eye of Moby Dick. But the whale rushed round in a sudden maelstrom, seized the swimmer between his jaws, and, rearing high up with him, plunged headlong again and went down. Meantime, at the first tap of the boat's bottom, the lakeman had slackened the line so as to drop astern from the whirlpool. Calmly looking on, he thought his own thoughts, but a sudden, terrific downward jerking of the boat quickly brought his knife to the line. He cut it, and the whale was free. But at some distance, Moby Dick rose again with some tatters of Radney's red woolen shirt caught in the teeth that had destroyed him. All four boats gave chase again, but the whale eluded them and finally wholly disappeared. So I'm sorry I have to stop now. Uh, and I'm going to read the rest of this chapter the next time. Bye bye. Till then. See you.